Today on the Matt Wall Show, Netflix employees stage a walkout in protest of Dave Chappelle's comedy special as the CEO of the company begins to cave as expected. Also, Jen Psaki has a good laugh over the supply chain crisis. It's pretty funny, she thinks. Katie Couric complains about sexism in the news industry, and Texas passes a bill banning biological males from female sports, and the media reacts in predictable fashion to that. And is there systemic racism in the zookeeping community? The Washington Post says there is. We'll discuss that important issue and much more today on The Matt Wall Show. You know, as an increasing number of companies fall over themselves trying to appeal to the left, like Netflix, um, wouldn't it be nice to find one that supports your values? Charity Mobile is the pro-life phone company. They partner with you to automatically support the pro-life, pro-family charity of your choice with 5% of your monthly plan price. And they've sent millions of dollars to charity so far. And so you are, just by signing up for Charity Mobile, you're helping to build a culture of life in America. And you're also getting a great service at the same time. It's a win-win situation. New activations and eligible accounts get a free cell phone with free activation. And it's really easy to switch. You can keep your existing phone number and you may even be able to keep your existing phone as well. If you need a new phone, no problem. Charity Mobile has a variety of options from basic flip phones and low-cost smartphones to the latest 5G phones. Monthly plan prices have just been lowered again, and now you can add even more lines to your family plan as well. They've got great live customer service based right here in the USA. So switch to Charity Mobile and support the causes that you care about. Call them at 1-877-474-3662 or chat with them online at charitymobile.com and mention offer code Walsh. Now, perhaps the state of our culture and our country can be summed up with this fact. We have been debating a comedian's stand-up act for three weeks because he said that only women can give birth. I mean, these, these days, almost nothing stays in the news for three weeks. Afghanistan only made it two weeks. Mass shootings get three days at most, unless the shooter is black, in which case they get 30 minutes. Natural disasters might get a week, depending. Nothing remains relevant this long. I mean, they could tell us that an asteroid the size of Alaska is going to hit the Earth in three weeks, and we'll have stopped talking about it and moved on to another subject 10 days before it hits. We would notice a giant shadow being cast on the ground. We look up and say, oh yeah, I forgot about that whole asteroid thing. And those would be our last words. A fitting and merciful end. Uh, the point is that it takes something truly, truly earth-shattering to attract and keep our attention. And a statement like, only women can give birth, is what qualifies in our day and age as truly earth-shattering. There is no sign um, of this story, story dying anytime soon either. As the media tells me, That today, trans and non-binary Netflix employees and their allies will be walking out of the job over at Netflix headquarters to protest Dave Chappelle's biologically correct observations. Now, if I were the CEO of Netflix, I would respond to the walkout by locking the doors behind them and immediately turning on the outdoor sprinklers. But the actual Netflix CEO, Ted Sarandos, doesn't quite have that in him. Now, in the early going, Sarandos did defend Chappelle, and he, he, he took a, a, a stand for free speech, allegedly. And he earned some pats on the, on the head and you know high fives from the right for this response. But I was a little bit more circumspect. Corporate America, especially big tech, is run by a gaggle of glutinous, timid slugs. I mean, they, they've all had their spines surgically removed so that they can contort into whatever shape is necessary. Is it possible, is it really possible that one of them would actually stand up to this kind of pressure? Is it it conceivable that one of these floppy, feeble little worms would have the strength and will to defend a man's right to make biologically accurate assertions at a comedy special? Well, I'll believe it when I see it. And I don't think we're seeing it here. Because right on cue, as the anti-science whack jobs walk out of their jobs, the CEO, Sarandos, is, is beginning to waver. This is from the Daily Wire today. It says, Netflix uh, co-CEO Ted Sarandos backtracked over defending Dave Chappelle from the woke mob on Tuesday, claiming that he, quote, screwed up. Sarandos made the remark in an interview with the Wall Street Journal in response to Netflix's The Closer, which has been widely praised by many online and reviews, with audience scores reaching as high as 97% on the popular website to Rotten Tomatoes. Chappelle Triggered the far left with jokes about the trans community, defending J.K. Rowling and going after the LGBT community for trying to cancel a rapper over a comment the rapper made. Sarando said, quote, what I should have led with in those emails was humanity. I should have recognized the fact that a group of our employees was clearly hurting. To be clear, storytelling has an impact in the real world. 
sometimes quite negative, Sarando said, after he previously stated the opposite. And he continues, we have articulated to our employees that there are going to be things that you don't like. There are going to be things that you might feel are harmful. But we're trying to entertain a world with varying tastes and varying sensibilities and various beliefs. And I think this special is consistent with that. So the cave has begun in earnest. Now, granted, he's still defending the decision to air the special, but he's equivocating because he's now validating the pain that grown adults allegedly feel over comments made during a comedy special. They're really hurting, he says. And this is always step one on the way towards total submission and surrender. This is the bow. Next, he'll be on his knees, and next, he'll be lying prostrate on the ground. And next, who knows what he'll be doing? I don't even want to speculate. It's inevitable. I mean, it's, it's, it always goes this way, because there's no midway point. There's no neutral ground between the rational side and the side where a bunch of pink-haired weirdos are screaming about how men can give birth to if they want. They, they the people on that side, they give you only two options. Reject them and everything they stand for, or fall in line. Nothing in between. Rationality cannot validate irrationality. When, a, when, a, when an adult is being unreasonable, there is nothing to do but treat them as such. You know, you cannot say to the unreasonable person, hey, you're totally unreasonable, but I understand how you feel and your feelings are valid and important. No, if you understand how they feel and their feelings are valid, then they aren't being unreasonable. If they're unreasonable, the only proper response is, hey, you shouldn't feel the way you do right now. Your feelings are absurd and irrelevant to me, and you need to grow up and do better. This is a you problem. Now, this past weekend, while the uh, mob of hyenas were barking at me because I made a few basic common sense points about paternity leave, as we've discussed, um, I, did, I posted one of my patented non-apologies to Twitter in, in the middle of all this. Here's what, what it said, what I posted. I said, okay, I've listened to your feedback. I understand that many of you are upset about what I said. Many of you have told me that my opinion was personally offensive to you. Moreover, my perspective didn't match with your own lived experience. Over the course of the last couple of days, I've had a chance to reflect. I never intended for my words to cause division, much less hurt and pain. This has been a wake-up call, and it's made me realize something. I realize that I'm extremely right, more, than, more right than I've ever imagined. My critics are wrong. They're also disingenuous, insufferable, and stupid, and their feelings are irrelevant. I'm not sorry at all, and I never will be. Anyway, while you're here, please subscribe to my podcast. So I like to do this whenever I'm the subject of outrage because I want the outraged masses to feel completely disregarded and trivialized by me. I also want them to know that I'm blatantly exploiting and profiting from their outrage. And I'm doing it openly and without apology. I believe that this is the only correct response in these situations. The only one. But I did hear from quite a few people on the right over the weekend who expressed disappointment in my approach and insisted that, I, that I'm being unchristian and unkind. They said that, uh, you know, I can hold the line and stand up to the bullies without being such a jerk about it. Notably, none of the people who said this to me have ever actually had thousands of enraged psychopaths coming after them, calling for their job in their head. I deal with this three times a week. Maybe you should defer to the person with more experience in the field. But, of course, I, I realize that my approach doesn't enjoy universal approval among even my ostensible al allies. But you should know why I take this stance in contrast to what Ted Sarandos at Netflix is doing. It's because we've been gentle and validating and kind to the anti-truth tyrants for decades making sure to take their feelings into account, even as they try to cut our throats and ruin our lives and eat our children's souls. And that's only fueled the very fire we're supposed to be trying to extinguish. It also drives them deeper into their delusions. See, when you show empathy to someone who's unreasonable, irrational, and disingenuous, you're only affirming them in that state. You are saying, I understand where you're coming from, when in fact you don't. And you shouldn't. And you shouldn't pretend you do. This is no small point. This isn't some kind of game we're playing. Our country is being driven into absolute lunacy. Total moral and intellectual collapse is happening right now around us. It's real. 
You can't conceive of the sort of darkness we're going to be living in and our children will be living in if we allow this collective march into madness to continue apace. This is, this is not a time for tenderness and politeness or even kindness. Now, in quieter and calmer times, you can afford to be quiet and gentle yourself. But when your civilization is in free fall, plunging into screaming insanity, it becomes necessary to raise your voice, be a little more abrupt and firm. And yeah, maybe a little rude too. We can play nice later. Now is not the time. Now let's get to our five headlines. You know, I'm a very particular person. Someone call me picky. I don't like it when choices are made for me. I like to make my own choices. And what if you were able to do the same thing for hiring? Choose your ideal candidate before they even apply. That's where ZipRecruiter's invite to apply comes in. It gives you as the hiring manager the power to pick your favorites from top candidates. And right now, you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Walsh. How does invite to apply work? Well, when you post a job on ZipRecruiter, they send you the most qualified people for the job. Then you can easily review the candidates and invite your top choices to apply for the job. Lauren Webb, SVP of Talent Acquisition uh, for Mandela Health, raves about ZipRecruiter's invite to apply. She says, I love that uh, it features because we have much higher follow through rate if I invite candidates. It's easy for me and it's easy for them. In fact, according to ZipRecruiter's internal data, jobs where employers use ZipRecruiter's invite to apply get on average two and a half times more candidates applying. You can see for yourself, just go to this exclusive web address, ziprecruiter.com slash Walsh, W-A-L-S-H, to try ZipRecruiter for free. That's ziprecruiter.com slash Walsh. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Speaking of um, places where, where you shouldn't be nice, where, where it's not the time or place to be nice, we, we talked yesterday. I went into great detail. I think I probably went on for 15 minutes to close the show about um, proper urinal etiquette. And I could have done 60 minutes on it. It's that important of a subject to me personally, and I think to society. And yet, uh, I, so I spent all this time talking about it. And then uh, we're, I, I'm at an event uh, speaking, at an event here in Michigan, Right to Life event. It's a great event, wonderful people, uh, as always in the pro-life movement. So, so the, the, the nicest people you ever meet are in the pro-life movement. Uh, maybe sometimes a little bit too nice because, you know, before I had to, I, I, I went up there to speak, I ran, had to run to the bathroom and I go into the bathroom and as soon as I walk in, there's a guy in there. He says, Hey, Matt Walsh, how you doing? And he, and he, and he starts talking to me and I'm thinking, dude, why we, I, we just had this conversation. This is not, no, no, no. This, this, it's become a, a real problem. I've noticed M- more and more. Men not realizing, I had the same thing at an airport about two weeks ago. Now you understand why I, why I spent 15 minutes on it. Maybe I'll spend another 15 minutes on it right now. I had the same thing. At it. Now, at least yesterday, I was just walking in and the guy talked to me. Um, in, 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 in general, listen, I think I'm pretty approachable. Well, probably not. I'm not approachable at all. But I'm not some sort of, uh, you know, I'm, it's, that's just my general aura. I can't do anything about that. But in a, in, a, in a bathroom is not the place. And then it was at an airport a couple of weeks ago. And at the urinal, someone recognizes me and starts talking to me. And I'm thinking, this, you, you can't do this. This, is, this should be a crime. I should be able to call security on you. So we're going we're gonna to continue with this conversation about urinal etiquette until it improves. But there are also other things to talk about. Like Jen Psaki, uh, she was having a good laugh over the supply chain crisis yesterday. And it's funny to her, I guess. Let's uh, listen to this. Just a question on the timing uh, on the supply chain issue. Yeah. Um, actions that the president has taken. It, it was clear in March of 2020 when COVID hit that, that the supply chains across the world had been disrupted. Even as, as the sort of work to fight back against COVID proceeded, people, it was, it was crystal clear that things were not improving on supply chain. People couldn't get dishwashers and and furniture and treadmills delivered on time, not to mention all sorts of other things. So why the is it... The tragedy of the short, the treadmill that's delayed. Right, the, tre- right, the, problem. Uh, the tragedy of the treadmill that's delayed. That's <laughs> just a bunch of... Isn't that silly? You know, we're, we're talking about a lot more than treadmills, Pasaki. But even for the treadmills, 
yeah, there is a tragedy in that too. There, there are working class people who work in industries assembling, making, distributing treadmills and other exercise equipment. I mean, their jobs are on the line. So yeah, there's a tragedy there. Even for something as silly as a treadmill. But it, it, this goes far beyond treadmills. It's, a, it's all a joke to them. They, they, it doesn't, doesn't mean anything to them. This is, this is the, one of the worst kinds of crises for these people to be in charge of fixing. I can't really think of a crisis that, that they would be suited to fix, but especially not one like this. Because they're not overly affected by it. And uh, they, don't, they don't understand. In fact, we, we, we've had, there's, there've been articles, I think it was the New York Times, Washington Post, they're all the same, it doesn't matter. One of these outlets published something a few days ago saying, hey, stop, it's not a big deal, stop, stop complaining, just get used to it. I mean, to them, a supply chain crisis is just, uh, you know, you ordered some some Christmas gifts and they're going to be a little bit late, a little bit late. No big deal. Uh, when, in fact, these are people's lives and, and jobs that are on the line. Maybe not yours. It was the same thing with the with the COVID lockdowns. Hey, it's no big deal. Just stay home for two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks. You know, in fact, let's make it six months. Our jobs aren't affected. Our, our pay will, will come, come pouring in still. In fact, if anything, we're going to get paid more. But you guys will be fine. As I've said before, they, the thing is, they don't see the ruling class, uh, the elites... They, they really don't see the rest of us as human beings. I mean, they, they might recognize us on some intellectual level as being humans, technically speaking, but, but that's it. Uh, in, in every other sense, to them, we are animals in an aquarium. You know, we're like little pets. And as long as we're, as long as we, we, we're, we're kept fed and we are sustained in that way, and we're kept relatively comfortable, nothing else matters. Quality of life, what does that matter? You know, how, much, how much enjoyment you're getting out of life, that, that, that doesn't matter either. That's why they can you know, shut down the schools, shut down the playgrounds for a year, tell kids to stay home. Oh, what do your kids need to go into play? It's, it's a playground. It's just them enjoying their childhood and their lives. <laughs> What's, what does that matter for? It matters for them because they're humans, but, uh, but not for us. Just as when you see a gerbil in a, in a cage, you don't spend a lot of time thinking about, is that gerbil really enjoying himself? How much joy can he really find in life? What, what, is this, what is the gerbil's quality of life? You might think about it for a second and think, well, that would kind of suck to be a gerbil in a cage, but then you move on with your life. And that's how these people see us. We are, we are gerbils in cages to them. All right, here's, uh, so Texas has, is really on a roll. Uh, first, they passed the bill banning abortions after six weeks, and uh, they're not slowing down. This is a good lesson. What the Republicans in Texas are doing is now and has been for a while a good lesson for conservatives and other Republicans all across the country. You stay on offense. You know, I, I think for, for many other Republicans, well, they would never pass that abortion bill in the first place. But if they did, they would spend the next six years defending it. And that's all they would do. Um, but Texas Republicans, they've said, no, we, we've done that. That's done. And, uh, and okay, now we're going to do this. And they've now passed a bill that would ban biological males from uh, female sports. It also, by the way, bans females from, bio, from, from male sports, but that never really comes up because you, never, you, know, you very rarely see it in the reverse where the females, which, which, is a very, which is a very interesting phenomenon. Even though transgenderism is far more common um, among adolescent girls, the sports issue is almost exclusively boys trying to play against the girls. Wonder why that is. So... The legislator passed this bill. It is now on, on Greg, uh, Governor Abbott's desk, where I assume he will be signing it uh, today or, or soon at least. 
And the media is responding, as you can expect, and so is the White House. This is from Axios. It says, a White House spokesperson on Tuesday condemned a Texas bill that would force public school students to play on sports teams based on their assigned sex at birth. Force them. For, it would force them to do exactly what everyone in sports has been doing from time immemorial. It would, it would force them to do exactly what we've all been doing, which is that you play against members of your same sex. Um, it's, uh, let's see here. This, this is according to a White House spokesman. Says, this hateful bill in Texas is just the latest example of Republican state lawmakers using legislation to target transgender kids, whom the president believes are some of the bravest Americans, in order to score political points. These anti-transgender bills are nothing more than bullying disguised as legislation, and they undermine our nation's core values. Which values are those exactly that are being undermined by affirming the differences between the sexes? And affirming that a boy who says he's a girl is still, is still a male. What value is being undermined exactly? Can you go into more detail about that? And as far as targeting transgender kids, the word transgender isn't mentioned in the legislation. It isn't mentioned in any of these pieces of legislation that we've seen uh, around the country. That's, it, it, there is no bill anywhere saying that transgender kids aren't allowed to play sports. And I tell you right now. Whatever you think of me when it comes to trans issues, if, if, there, were, if, if there was a legislature trying to pass a bill saying that, uh, quote-unquote, transgender kids aren't allowed to play sports, I'd be against that. Because the, the point is precisely that it, it doesn't, when you're playing sports, it doesn't matter how you internally identify or how you perceive yourself. What matters is what biological category you fall into. That's it. And as long as you're playing in your own biological category, I, I don't care how you perceive yourself. Doesn't make a difference. Uh, but the media, of course, going into overtime over this. And we'll, we'll just play one example here. This is a, a local news affiliate in Texas um, trying, to, trying to show us the, the pain and suffering and damage that this bill is going to cause. Let's watch this. Governor Greg Abbott is expected to sign this bill, which requires athletes to play on teams that align with their genders listed on their birth certificates. Proponents of the bill say it will protect girls from having to compete with stronger and bigger athletes. But trans athletes say it unfairly targets them. ABC 13's Pooja Lodia has a story from an eight year old and her fight for acceptance. Sonny Bryant and her mother Becca have testified in front of legislators in Austin multiple times. They say they want to share their story because they feel like people will better understand their position if they get to know them. Here is my hilarious comic. Sonny Bryant is eight now, but she says she's known who she is since she was four. I am a girl. This is not pretend. This is not a phase. Um, and it's yes, real. It it's, there's a difference between saying, I want to be a girl and I am a girl. And that was oh, really? What's very the clear by her. Her family has been supportive and most of her young classmates don't ask much. They've always played sports like baseball and gymnastics yeah, together. Because they'll be expelled but if they ask the any questions. But when the Texas legislature why. began debating a bill that would make it so that she will only be able to play on boys sports teams, she and her mom went to Austin. It was kind of emotional, and no, I was kind of. No, the mom really went to nervous. Austin and dragged Pollution him in along. Search of a problem. We haven't had any lawsuits in the state of Texas. We haven't had any cases, and the population of trans kids, kids is so small. So that means she'd be the only girl in a locker room, only girl on the team. She won't have that community that you get. I like baseball, tennis gymnastics and soccer. What is in my heart is I think I should be able to play sports because I am a girl too. Sunny is still only eight years old. Okay. So her mother right, says she still has a uh, so, so we're supposed to believe this, this kind of thing. It, it, enrage, it enrages me every time I see it. It will never not enrage me. 
to see kids being treated this way by that. I have to stifle myself. I, you know, I, just, I know we just said, but we, we, can't, we can't worry about people's feelings of being gentle and everything. But um, I also don't necessarily want to get completely deplatformed. Um, that mother, here, here's what I'll say about the mother. There is no eight-year-old on the planet who is saying to their mother, oh, let, let's go to the state capitol and lobby over this bill that's being proposed. Hey, mom, I want to become a political activist. That's what I want to do. I have eight-year-olds. I have two of them right now. They have no idea what bills are being passed. The state legislature, let's go to the state capitol and lobby over bills. They're not thinking about that. You know what my son is thinking about? He's thinking about uh, he wants to go outside and, and run around and re- wrestle around with his brother. And, uh, and throw rocks at various objects. No, they, they, could, they could go outside, and, uh, and that's, that's an afternoon. I mean, just picking up rocks and like throwing them at trees. I've told them don't throw them at anything that's alive, but other than that, throw all you want. That's what they're thinking about. No, no eight-year-old. So we're supposed to believe that this eight-year-old has chosen to become a, 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 a political you know, advocate, has chosen to be the face of of transgender rights in Texas, just like we're supposed to believe that at four four years old, this boy discovered his inner female identity. And that, that mother says, well, there's a difference between saying, I want to be a girl and I am a girl. Yeah, really? What's the difference exactly? What is the difference when a four year old says it? Is there a difference when a four-year-old says, um, I am a lion versus I want to be a lion? There's no response. This, of course, is the point that we on the sane side have been making. One of the points, which is that little kids have no concept of their own identity. They have extremely active imaginations. They, they get into phases that can last sometimes for months or years even. And sometimes kind of weird phases where they get really obsessed with a certain idea or concept or, or imaginary thing. That's all perfectly normal for kids. Which is why a young child can claim to be an animal or a superhero or some sort of mythological being and really believe it on some level. Because for to, to them, the distinction between playing pretend, between using your imagination and reality, you know, there, there is really no distinction. That's why at four years, four years old, uh, you could have a kid who, who almost every parent on the planet at one point has had a conversation with their child about how there's no monsters in the closet. Here, I'll open up the closet for you. Shine a light into it. There's no monsters. You see, there's nothing in there. But they don't understand that because in their heads, they feel like there's monsters in the closet. And so the idea that they could feel that something is true and yet it not actually be true, that's not something that they can wrap their heads around yet. So we keep making this point, and the other side, all they do is scoff at it. Oh, this is totally different. A four-year-old saying they're a four-year-old boy saying he's a girl is not the same as a four-year-old boy saying he's a dog. Really, it isn't. How's it any different? Tell me. If the, if we on the sane side, if we ran society, you know, if we had not ceded and surrendered our society the way that we have, uh, that mother would be going to prison for the rest of her life, which is where she belongs. This is her, this, as I always say, this is Munchausen by proxy. This is her imposing her delusions, her sickness, her mental illness onto that child. And then, tra- and then traipsing him around like a, like a trophy, like a little mascot, like a, a prize that she's been awarded. You know, we, we hear about men that have trophy wives. Well, there are parents that, that make little trophy children for themselves. 
so they can earn woke points and they can earn social credibility. They can up their social score. And so they can show the entire world, look at my trans child. I have no sympathy for these parents at all. I know some people do. They say, well, look at these parents, you know, they, they're in a difficult situation. They don't know what to do. No, no sympathy. Look, if, if you're a parent and you're adult and, and you're a good parent and you've raised your, your kids the right way and your 14 year old girl goes to public school and comes home one day out of the blue and says, I think I'm a boy. I have sympathy for you there in that case with with adolescent girls or, or boys who um, just one day out of nowhere get this idea in their head. And uh, and you've got the school system working against you, all of their peers, everything in the culture and media. I mean, that's one thing. But if you're a four year old, you know, if you're a parent with a four year old, quote, transgender, that's on you. And that is really easy. That's a that's a really easy problem to solve. Very easy. The only way that problem maintains is if you want it to be that way. All right. What else we got here? So. Okay, I wanted to play this for you as well. Uh, I've had this for a few days to play. There's a show on HBO called Scenes from a Marriage, and uh, it's all about a marriage falling apart. And this is a, like I said, a show. I think it's like eight episodes long. So this is eight hours, eight to ten hours of sitting there and watching a marriage fall apart. I'm not exactly sure what would drive someone to spend their time, especially if you're if you are a married couple. And you're going to say to your wife, hey, honey, you know, everything's going well for us. Let's spend um, let's spend eight to ten hours, uh, you know, immersing ourselves in the story of, of someone else's marriage disintegrating. And that seems like that could be something that would really affirm us and in in in, in, in strengthen us in our relationship. So uh, for whatever reason, this, this show exists and people watch it. And the lead actress, Jessica Chastain, was on The View bragging about her feminist convictions uh, in refusing to go fully nude unless the man in the show also is fully nude. Listen. There was a full frontal nude scene, everyone. And so sorry. <laughs> Twitter. So I, I feel, I'm feeling objectified right now. So she gets all the deep questions. Yeah. I just, I just. Uh, what the hell's going on? I here? hate to do it, but I have to ask. Um, you know, it really. What do you want to know? It really, it really set everything on fire. Twitter. We were talking about it. Were you surprised at that reaction? Um, and was there ever a moment where you no. sort of second guessed no, of your decision to <laughs> reveal yourself? You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome, Twitter. Uh, I uh, I was surprised because I didn't know that was going to happen. Uh, I had been, you know, you get sent the stuff to look at and to be like, okay, I'm fine with that. But I saw it on a laptop, quite dark, and I didn't notice oh. uh, what was happening down there. And uh, surprise, surprise. But, you know, it was a surprise when I started seeing all these like things of like it's full frontal. Like, no, what are you talking about? And I <laughs> and I saw it. Then clear, clear as day on yeah. the big TV there. It's it's there. Wow, it's like. Everyone to. It's like, surprise, Mr. Happy! Oh, Mr. Yeah. Happy! Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I said to Hagai, who wrote and directed the series in the very beginning, I said, I'm comfortable with all the nudity, but any part of my body that you show, you're gonna have to show the same with Oscar. So, like, there's a shower scene that I have in episode two, right. mm-hmm. and you see my body. And so now, like, you frontal. see his body. Right. So That's typical, though, to women's bodies. Yeah, yeah but so right. for me, though, I wanted it to be balanced. That's so bold, though, that's that you, good. you said, I, I'll do it, but the, these need to be the terms. Who is watching this show? Speaking of why, I mean, it seems from, from marriage, who's watching that, but, but uh, even more so. Who is actually sitting down to watch The View? Does, does anyone? Or does this show just live on viral clips that are mostly shared around by people who hate the show, like myself? But this is, uh, here, here we have, this is, what, this is what feminism is now. Yeah, sure, I will... Uh, you know, degrade myself. I'll take my clothes off on camera. That's perfectly fine. As long as he's degrading himself too. If we could degrade ourselves together, then, uh, then somehow it balances out and we have protect- and both of us have protected our dignity. This, this to me is, is very similar to the Hooters situation that we talked about yesterday. Women signing up to become waitresses at a place called Hooters where the food is terrible because they're not selling food. They're selling the waitresses. That's what they're selling. So people can go and look at the waitresses. You, you sign up to, to do that. 
to really sell your body, I mean, visually at least. And uh, but but then they draw the line and say, oh, these shirt these these shorts are a little too skimpy. I'll go with the extra skimpy shorts. I'm fine with that, but not the extra extra skimpy shorts. That's over the line, sir. I have standards as a woman. So this is very similar to that. We we, we see the the impotency of feminism, which is inevitable that, that feminism will become as impotent as it has been when feminists are also most of them. Perfectly, perfectly willing to sit back and watch as uh, as men are, are are you know appropriate their identity and I, I wonder how many feminists with with Rachel Levine yesterday being awarded for the, the first quote female four star admiral how many feminists look at that and, and actually feel that a glass ceiling has been broken for them. Yeah, look at look at this Rachel, Rachel Levine breaking up that old boys club. This old white man breaking up the old boys club. I wonder how many see it that way. Of course they don't, but they remain silent and because uh, you know they've been scared into submission, and so feminism has become this pitiful, pathetic, impotent little thing, and that's what it is now. It's not. Hey, I refuse to take my clothes off. I'm not going to do that. This is gratuitous. It's not necessary for the story. There's no reason why you need full frontal nudity for me to tell this story about the marriage falling apart. You don't need that. Now, she's not taking that stand. She'll still do it as long as the guy is too. As long as we can all march together into our own um, humiliation and degradation, then everything will be fine. All right, let's move now to reading the comments. Who's rocking polka dot and flannel shirts without shame? Do you know their name? They're the sweet baby gang. Uh, Rachel says, Matt, how do you reconcile being a masculine man and wearing makeup? Well, it's a Rachel, it's a tool of the trade. But they're construction workers. For them, it's a hammer. Right? For a police officer, he's got his gun. A lumberjack has his axe. I have makeup. I feel like I didn't do myself any favors with that answer whatsoever, but... There it is. Um, BD says, uh, late upload today, thought you pulled a butt gig for a second. You thought I was doing what now? Buttigieg. Okay, so Buttigieg. You thought that I was what, going on paternity leave rather than putting the show up. Uh, yeah, it was a little bit late, but we, but we got it up, so no reason for complaints. Um, Kyle says, Matt used to give the impression that flying was mostly just an annoyance for him, but he's made it clear and clearer lately that he's just afraid of it. My wife is a little afraid of flying, but it's never bothered me in the least. I hate the in-ear pressure issues that I get sometimes, and it's even caused some pretty bad sinus issues, which may last days or even weeks after the flight. But I've never been afraid of flying. I actually enjoy it, assuming it's not too cramped and crowded. Well, nice for you, Kyle. Look, flying is the the only thing. I, I, I am afraid of one thing. I fear only one thing, and that's it. It's just flying. And uh, spiders. But those are the only two things. Uh, Joy says, Matt, please don't give anyone a relief band as a gift. I question when he says those comments if it's quiet sarcasm on his part. These, these accusations that I get during the comment section, that I am anything less than sincere and enthusiastic when I am reading advertisements from our, from our fantastic sponsors, uh, I take, I'm starting to get personally offended by it. First of all, I would never engage in sarcasm. You know that. Uh, Cade says, Matt, pl- Matt, planes literally give people in the exit row a packet with everything they have to do in the event of an emergency. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, they tell you that, but no one ever looks at it. And I don't want to be the one dork who actually, it, you, I've been sitting, I've, I've, I sit in the exit row every time I get it, every, every chance I get. And, uh, so I've given, I've been given this speech a hundred times. And they say, well, exit row, you got to help people get off the plane. There's more information in the packet. No one ever, ever, ever picks that thing up and, and looks at it. And so I'm not going to either. So I sit there in ignorance. Meaning that when the time comes, if I'm actually called upon, I won't know what to do. And everybody on the plane might die just, so, just because I didn't want to look like a dork and read the packet. And Sean says, three stooges wore dresses. They did it better than Harry. Yeah, there are so many examples. Um, 
throughout history of men wearing dresses, especially in modern history. And in the comments yesterday, a lot of people giving other examples, as Billy Porter claims, you know, claims that he was the first, he was the, the, the first man to wear a dress. He, he invented this. But Dennis Rodman wore a, a wedding dress to when he married Carmen Electra, and they stayed married for, you know, t- 12 days or whatever it was. So this has been happening. Men have been doing this. But here's the difference. There is, there is, there is a difference. There, there has been a change, okay, when it comes to this. And the difference is that you talk about the, th- the Three Stooges. They were men wearing dresses because it's funny. It was supposed to be funny. Like, you'd laugh at it. You, you would see it as absurd. Dennis Rodman wearing the wedding dress. It's, it's, it's supposed to be absurd. It's something that you gawk at. And Dennis Rodman was all about being gawked at. And so that's, that's what it was. Um, now, the only difference now is that men will do this and expect to be taken seriously. So it's the, it's the, it's not the men, man wearing the dress that's different. It's the man wearing the dress with the self-serious, self-aggrandizing attitude. That's the only, the only difference. And despite that attitude that they have, the fact is it will never not be ridiculous. You're a man, you put on a dress, you look absurd, you look ridiculous, and you deserve to be laughed at. As I'm sure you already know, uh, October is Cybersecurity Awareness Month. There's always something that we should be aware of for each given month. And this month is cybersecurity. And this year's theme is Do Your Part, Be Cyber Smart. Getting cyber smart starts with uh, cyber hygiene, which is basic habits that can help uh, keep you and your family protected from identity theft, scams, and other online dangers. Examples of good cyber hygiene include using strong passwords, setting up multi-factor authentication on your accounts, and regularly updating software on your devices. Listen, every day we put our information at risk on the internet. In an instant, a cyber criminal could harm what's yours, your finances, your credit. Good thing there's LifeLock. LifeLock helps detect a wide range of identity threats, like if your social security number is for sale on the dark web. If they detect your information, they will send you an alert. And if something does happen, God forbid, to your identity, they also have their identity theft restoration specialists who are on staff and ready to help you out with that. Nobody can prevent all identity theft or monitor all transactions at all businesses, but you can keep what's yours with LifeLock Identity Theft Protection. Join now and save up to 25% off your first year at lifelock.com slash Walsh. That's lifelock.com slash Walsh for 25% off. And there's more. When it comes to the facts, the Daily Wire's newest podcast, Morning Wire, has a never-ending supply. Not only has it been topping the Apple and Spotify charts since its release, it's the only daily podcast that values your time and the truth. And while we're working overtime to bring you the news you need to know, we need your help to keep the facts trending towards number one. So subscribe and start listening right now to Morning Wire on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts and leave a five-star review if you like what you hear. And even if you don't, leave it anyway. Be a nice person. Now let's get to our daily cancellation. Today we have to cancel the Washington Post for an article published yesterday with the exceedingly bizarre headline, Zookeeping isn't common in the black community. This black zookeeper wants to change that. Now, if you have a moderately well-tuned BS detector, you hopefully have already noticed a major problem with the claim being made here. Yes, zookeeping isn't common in the black community. It also isn't common in any other community. Zookeeping is is common among zookeepers, and that's it. From what I've read statistically, over 90% of zookeepers engage in zookeeping. But the numbers are considerably lower for all other communities, including white people. I've been a white person most of my life, and I've never known a zookeeper. It's not like zookeeping is a profession that white suburban parents tend to push their kids into. Growing up, I, I never had a friend tell me, man, you know, I really want to be a, go to school and be a doctor, but my dad is pressuring me to keep zoos. He won't shut up about it. You know, he says, uh, if I was a zookeeper. My father was a zookeeper. Son, you come from a long line of zookeepers. Now, that's not a conversation I ever had. But let's not let any of that get in the way of racializing the zookeeping profession. So here's the Washington Post. Craig Sappho was at Fresno Chaffee Zoo's Big Cats exhibit when he saw the man. Outbounds this black guy in a zoo uniform, Sappho said. He had this walk, like the coolest walk you'll ever see. And I think, ah, that's cool. They let their volunteers come in. Then he realized the man wasn't a volunteer. He had his training buoy his target stick, his meat pouch, Sappho said. 
And he realized, oh my God, he's the keeper. Now, just to interject here, you, you should not be walking around the zoo with your target sticker, your meat, patch out, meat pouch out. Um, you, you should, there are children present. But that's neither here nor there. Back to the article. It says, the man didn't fit the profile of who most zookeepers in America are, white and female. I was mortified that I said that, Sappho said. Because like the man in Fresno, California, he was watching during a conference in 2018. Uh, and Sappho, too, is a black zookeeper. Zappho, 47, is the curator of large carnivores at the Smithsonian's National Zoo in D.C. And for decades, he has often been one of the few, if not the only, zookeeper of color in the room. Even as his responsibility and prestige in the field grew, his black friends would dismiss his work as white people stuff. And indeed, the field is about 74% white. Now, wait a second. 74% white? But white people also comprise about the same percentage of the overall population in the country. That would mean that white people are proportionally represented among zookeepers. What's the problem here? And even if zookeepers were 100% white, even if there were no ZOCs, zookeepers of color, still, what's the problem here? We'll have to read on to find out. It says, when he was at work at the National Zoo, where he's been for more than 25 years, people who didn't know him often assumed, as Sappho did with the black zookeeper in Fresno, that he's a volunteer or even a janitor. The same thing happened to Jordan Veasley, an animal zookeeper at Cougar Mountain Zoo in Washington State, who said that he gets asked if I'm a, if I'm a janitor or if I clean the bathrooms when he's walking around the zoo. Now, another brief side note. Um, that doesn't happen. I mean, I don't mean to question Jordan Veasley's lived experience, but I don't think that happens. Nobody's walking up to a random black guy at the zoo and saying, excuse me, do you clean the bathrooms? That's the kind of thing that you think white people would do if you've never met one in person and have learned about them only through Ibram X. Kendi seminars. No white person is just going to go up to a black guy and say, you there, yes, the, the toilets are unsightly in the restrooms. Please attend to them at once. I assume you're the janitor after all. I'm just, I'm skeptical about that, but let's keep reading a little more. It says, Veasley32, whose social media posts as Jungle Jordan are wildly popular, finally tackled his, um, his unicorn status in an emotional viral video. Okay, we have to stop again because you know I had to go find that emotional viral video about black zookeeping, and I did find it. And this viral video, by the way, was filmed in 2018 and has 4,000 views on YouTube. So we're really stretching the bounds of the viral designation here. Unless, the guy, unless they meant that the guy filmed the video while sick with a virus, I'm not sure. But uh, anyway, here it is. What is up everybody, it's your boy Jungle Jordan. As you can see by the title of this video, this is a really important video that I've been wanting to make for a long time and it's a pretty emotional topic for me. I, and that, but I feel like this needs to be said and everything I'm about, I'm about to say means a lot to me and it's very close to my heart. And it's really hard to talk about, so like I said, it took me a long time to even try to attempt to make this video. Even as I'm filming right now, it took me a long time to try to think of an intro of how to start this video. So I'm gonna go ahead and just get off and get into it. I'm gonna start by saying I am a black zookeeper now this means a lot there's a lot that comes with this with this phrase there's two words there black zookeeper both probably words you would have never heard combined together matter of fact never probably have seen those words combined together but yes we do exist well, yeah, I mean, those aren't words I hear together very often because I rarely talk about zookeepers. No offense. I, I don't hear any words combined with the word zookeeper because this si subject simply doesn't come up very often in my life. And on the rare occasion that I have had the opportunity to discuss zookeeping in any depth, I would normally refer to the zookeepers as just zookeepers without feeling the need to affix any racial designation to them. I mean, now that you mention it, I did see an Asian zookeeper at a zoo a few weeks ago, but I didn't go up to them and say, excuse me, Asian zookeeper, I have a question. In fact, I didn't think of them as an Asian zookeeper at all, really. I think I just thought of them as, as a zookeeper who happened to be Asian. But all that is beside the point. I go back to the question I posed at the beginning. Even if black people are underrepresented among zookeepers, why is that automatically a problem? Why does it matter? See, this is what the racialists do. They walk around the country randomly poking their heads into rooms and saying, hey, there should be more black people in here. That doesn't, they don't seem to care much about the math. There are a finite number of black people in the country, in the world even. There's only so many to go around. And yet, and yet they demand dramatically increased numbers of black people and other racial minorities in every, in every field and in every walk of life and in every nook and cranny of society. But the, the math doesn't work. If you insist on more black zookeepers and your demands are fulfilled, 
That's going to mean fewer black people in whatever field or profession they would have gone into instead. That problem should be apparent, I would think. Also, nobody's talking, taking into account free choice. Each individual black person in the country is a human being with free will. If not many of them become zookeepers, it's because not many have decided to make that choice with their lives. You can create more black zookeepers only by convincing black individuals to not choose whatever they were going to choose and choose zookeeping instead. But in what way does that represent progress? That's a lateral move. That's a reshuffling. You're shifting pieces around on the board. You're not adding new ones. Or perhaps I'm looking at this the wrong way. If we can't increase black representation in zookeeping by increasing the volume of black zookeepers, the other option is to decrease the volume of white zookeepers. Maybe we should fire 95% of the white zookeepers across the country, thereby tripling the percentage of black zookeepers in one fell swoop. Better yet, the most equal thing would be to have no zookeepers at all. Open the cages, let the animals wander around as they will. That would be true equity. It would also make for a much more entertaining zoo experience. And most importantly, racial balance at the zoo will finally be the last piece we need in order to usher in racial harmony across the globe. Seems like a crazy plan, perhaps. But it's better than the one offered by the Washington Post and black zookeeper Craig Sappho. And that's why they are both today, I, I'm afraid to say, canceled. And we'll leave it there. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Godspeed. The Matt Walsh Show is produced by Sean Hampton, executive producer Jeremy Boring. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. Our technical director is Austin Stevens. Production manager, Pavel Vodosky. The show is edited by Ali Hinkle. Our audio is mixed by Mike Cormina. Hair and makeup is done by Cherokee Hart. And our production coordinator is McKenna Waters. The Matt Wall Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2021. A man without any military experience becomes the nation's first female four-star general. The CDC accidentally admits that abortion is infanticide. And the Washington Post tells you to stop complaining about the supply chain crisis. Check it out on The Michael Knowles Show.